Listening Fan Fiction presents Solace and Sanctuary by Ignium807, part of the ongoing series If We Must Starve, Let It Be Together, based off the TV series The Witcher from Netflix, narrated for you by Sierra Fees. Chapter 1. The sanctuary began as a manor, the Viscount's estate, somewhere in the fertile fields of Carrick, Generations of nobility called the place home, servants tending the gardens and townsfolk looking toward it with the distant longing of those who live at the base of luxury. It was a house like any other to the untrained eye. Some sorcerers might see different. The occasional wise one would visit the house and wonder about the warmth against the back of their neck or the swirl of chaos blowing in from the grounds. A talented few could see the threads of destiny that floated around the house like white puffs of dandelion seeds, here one moment and gone the next. The threads crawled up the walls like ivy, stronger with each passing year, a tapestry of destiny slowly being woven. Dozens of hands worked on that tapestry, some knowing, some not. They touched it in their own ways, nimble and rough, teasing and certain, pulling together threads until the fabric of fate clung to the manor like a second skin, woven so neatly into every brick that one could no more remove it from the house than they could magic from the land. Yes, many hands wove the tapestry. Many legends called it home. But the first was named Eskel, and he was tired. The wounds aren't anything serious. There are scratches up and down both sides, but the bleeding stopped hours ago, and the bruises painted across his ribs are only large enough to ache, not threaten. Eskel ignores them as best he can. Snow pours down from the sky in a fit of divine temper. His horse's hooves sink into it too deep for comfort. The road before him has long since been obscured. Eskel pulls his hood in closer and shivers, thinking longingly of the roaring fires he left behind in Kermoran. He and his brothers had thought the weather temperate enough to descend for the year. Apparently the gods have other ideas for Carrick. There is a town nearby, of that Eskel is certain. He doesn't know which one. A contract for a pack of drowners brought him to the area, but along the road he has been accosted by bandits, attacked by an angry Kikimura, and knocked out not once, but twice, by a deranged sorcerer with an anti-witcher bent to his magic. He is rather understandably lost. But even through all the snow, Eskel can smell the town. There are hints of it on the air, merchant's perfumes along the road and the gentle scent of wood smoke drifting from the north. He follows the well-worn path, the thought of a hot meal and a decent bed keeping him upright in the saddle. Hopefully the locals will be more accommodating than the bastards with the drowner contract. Their insults still ring in his ears. For hours there is nothing, and then, like rays of sun breaking through the clouds, there is light. The glimmer of lamplight burns through the snow, heralding the edge of the town and the promise of respite from the cold. Eskel guides his horse toward it. An inn makes itself known through the blizzard. Eskel dismounts and uses his heavy boots to kick away snow from the stable doors, throwing them open with a shove of tired muscles and guiding Scorpion inside. He tends to him before heading to the inn. He'll owe him an apology in the morning. For now, he has earned the rest. Snow has accumulated in front of the inn's door, too. He kicks it away with an uncharacteristic growl and stumbles inside. Immediately, the scent of ale and fresh stew assaults his senses. Were Yasker traveling with him, Eskel thinks the bard might cry. Ale, he says, practically falling onto a stool at the bar. And a meal, please, whatever you have. Aye says the woman behind the counter. She fills a tankard and sets it before him, laughing as he knocks back half of it in one long draught. Alcohol may not provide any real warmth, but damn if it doesn't feel good going down. A meager bowl of stew follows the ale. It has little by way of meat, consisting mostly of broth after winter wore down the town's stores. Eskel eats it gratefully, ignoring the way his stomach growls even after the bowl is empty. You look like you've been through hell. The woman says, Eskel is taken aback. Rarely do people bother to initiate conversation with him, and even less when they aren't offering work. He wonders briefly if she's just looking for a lay, but dismisses the idea quickly. His scars make him unappealing at the best of times. Tonight is hardly the best of times. The gods tried to freeze me to death, 
he replies, gesturing vaguely at the outdoors. She takes a good long look at his armor, his scars, and the swords strapped across his back. It is the dance of recognition that he is seen on a thousand different faces in a thousand different towns. You're a witcher, Eskel inclines his head. I shall serve this. The woman leans in closer and stares at his medallion. Her eyebrows raise slightly in shock, and he turns to shout at another woman across the room. Oi, Ameli! This man here is a witcher! He's far too tired for another contract tonight. Perhaps Eskel thinks this town will be one of the few that takes credit. Another meal in a room in exchange for the promise of work if he's lucky. If not, he can make do in the stables. A matronly woman makes her way toward him. She has lines on her face and a set to her jaw that brooks no argument. From decades of dealing with foolish youngsters, no doubt. If his face could hold such lines, Eskel is sure Vesemir would look the same. He certainly has the same air about him. She slides onto the stool next to him with curiosity in her eyes. There is uncertainty in the way she watches him, but no fear. Eskel is thankful for it. How rich are ya? Uh-uh. Um. The woman peers at his medallion, and something in her expression softens. You're one of them wolf witchers. What are you doing here, dearie? Her words throw Eskel for a loop. He blinks at her, uncomprehending, and wonders if she plans on throwing him out of town, why his school should matter at all. Pardon me? She shakes her head at him like one would a disobedient child. At the inn, love, trying to get me in trouble you are. The Lord would have my head if he finds out there was a wolf witcher in town and he didn't come on up to the manor. Eskel looks to the barkeep for clarification but stops short at the look in her eyes. Caution, which he is more than used to, but overshadowing that bright as day is awe. She looks at him like young girls look at Yasker when he sings of princesses and destiny. I'm afraid I don't... He tries. The woman cuts him off of the wave. No matter, she says. Me and the others brought the carriage here for the night. The Lord won't care, my dear. Says it's all right long as we have it ready for him as he needs. She hops off the stool and makes for the back door, turning with her hands on her hips when Eskel remains seated. Come on, then. We've got to get back before the snow's too deep to ride in. Distantly, Eskel is aware of placing some coins down on the counter to pay for his meal. His feet follow the woman with little input from his conscious mind as she ushers him into a carriage with two of her companions and takes the horse's reins. He looks toward the inn's stable and, confident that his horse will be taken care of in the morning, lest the inn keep brisk angering a patron, relaxes back into his seat with bewilderment. The girls with whom he shares the carriage watch him with the same mix of wariness and awe that the bartender did. He shifts under their stare. He can deal with hate. Misplaced interest from adventurous women, too, though that's far more rare. These girls are too young for either, and experience tells him that both should reek of barely restrained fear. He is unsure what to do with the fact that they don't. Lucky for Eskel's sanity, the trip to the manor is short. Whoever built this particular royal carriage was a man who had seen snow before and prepared for it well. They move up the hill to the local manor and pull up next to a side door. Eskel stumbles out after the girl's confusion slowing his steps and is pulled forward by the older woman. She guides him inside with one hand on his upper arm. The lack of fear in the way she touches him throws Eskel's already weary mind into a spiral of unanswered questions. In search of something else to focus on, he looks around. The manor is homey. That's the only word he can think of to describe it, though Yasker would probably have a million more. There are paintings on the wall, like in any noble's manor, only these don't seem expensive. No, whoever put these up did so because they were pleasing, not to show off their wealth. The carpet is rich and well-tended, the ceilings high and cobweb-free. Eskel knows the look of castles. He knows that the beauty of a place is in its tending, and he knows that the Lord is not the one to do that tending. It is the servants who care for the house, whoever lives here, whatever he's like. His servants adore him. Their pride shines through in every well-oiled door hinge, every spotless corner. The woman, Amelie, he reminds himself, steers him into a sitting room and pushes him down onto a settee in front of a roaring fire. I'll get some warmer clothes, she says. Fool of a man traveling in so little. is barely spring, you know. 
I heard witchers were smarter than this. As Skull feels oddly chastised. A many sweeps out of the room, and he sits in silence, warming his hands over the fire, but doing little else to thaw out. The bruises across his chest begin to ache anew. A few minutes later, she returns with a pile of thick, dark woolen clothes in hand. You need help with that armor, then? Eskel glances down at his body. Snow had been crusted against the clips and buckles of his leather armor, but the snow was warmed it enough to be manageable. Besides, what is she to do if he says yes? Help him with it? The people of this town may be more welcoming than average, but Eskel very much doubts that Amelie would be comfortable so near him in a position where he could strike so easily. I... He shakes his head. No, thank you. Sort yourself. Cook's still awake. I'll have her make you up some. She tosses the pile of clothes on the settee and leaves again. Snow melts from Eskel's armor to soak the carpet beneath him, and he raises a hand to the pendant at his neck to ground himself, seeking the familiar hum of magic against his palm. Slowly, he pulls himself from his haze of weariness and shock and begins to strip. The fire is a balm against his frozen skin. A dry shirt, trousers, and what looks like a hand-knit sweater replace his traveling attire, which he lays out carefully by the fire to dry. Some lords are willing to put up with the witcher for the night if it means discounted work. It's a decent meal, most of the time. Eskel would happily take on a contract in return for escape from the elements. Problem is, he has seen neither high nor hair of this town's lord. The man can't know of his presence yet. Amali didn't have time to contact or consult him since she found Eskel at the inn. None of it lines up! The Lord will have my head if he finds out there was a wolf witcher in town and he didn't come on up to the manor. What kind of man would give such an order? Amali re-enters the room with a flourish, a portly man following closely at her heels. Her hands are occupied with a tray laden down with bread, salted meat, and a mug of something that steams up the air. She sets it on the table in front of his seat and gestures for him to eat. This here is Leo. She points to the man beside her, who bows low. Greetings, Master Witcher. And Eskel rips off a hunk of bread and adds it to the list. Perhaps the manor is enchanted. Wouldn't that be just his luck? But enchanted or not, he isn't one to turn down hospitality. Especially not with Yasker's voice in the back of his head, nagging him about... Propriety, dear witcher, a heartfelt thanks can get you things a sword never could. Thank you, he says. A pleasure, sir. Will you be wanting a bath before bed? No. All he wants is to collapse in a bed and sleep until his bruises stop throbbing. A week, maybe more. But if you have any spare bandages, I'll thank you for them. Have you need of a healer? Amali looks concerned. You didn't mention you were injured. Minor scrapes, nothing more. I can handle them myself. Aye, Leo agrees. I can find some bandages. We have some herbs lying about too for pain and inflammation and what not. I'll bring what I can find. Eskel nods to him, doing his best not to look intimidating. It's habit at this point, but seems redundant here. Leo doesn't appear any more afraid of him than Amelie or the girls in the carriage. If this place is enchanted, it's a damn strange choice of curse. He eats quickly, and Leo leads him upstairs to a bedroom. The pillows are more enticing than any siren song Eskel has ever heard. A fire boards in the fireplace, fresh wood stacked next to it. Servants bring up his armor from downstairs, laying it out precisely how he had it before, now in front of a new fire. They bow and cast unsubtle glances at his wolf medallion on their way out of the room. Will there be anything else, sir? Eskel turns to Leo, noting how the man stands respectfully at the threshold, not encroaching, not pushing, simply offering. His head is up, his eyes unflinching when Eskel meets them. Curiosity overcomes the pressing need for sleep. What is the name of your lord? A furrow creases Leo's brow. You don't know. I got rather lost on the road here. I appreciate the hospitality truly, but I have no clue where I am. Ah. Uh. Leo sweeps into a dramatic bow that reminds Eskel of a certain bard and says, With pride, sir, I serve Lord Julian Alfred Pancras. He looks at Eskel expectantly. Eskel raises his eyebrows. He has never heard of a man named Pancras. The fusion takes up residence in Leo's expression and he searches Eskel's face for a moment. Realization when it comes is gentle. But you? 
Leo says softly. Likely know him by another name. He gestures to the pendant around Eskel's neck, nestled comfortably next to his wolf medallion, and offers him a knowing smile. You are in the manner of the poet Rashka Master Witcher. Welcome to Lentwolf. 